I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me once again back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I do need to mention, uh, there's an announcement I have to give. Dr. Burgraff asked me to remind you that today the chairs have to be taken up. Is that it? Okay. Chairs have to go today. That's the announcement. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Someone has said that many, many topics are like pennies. I think I have one in my pocket here. And if I were to take it this morning and throw it in the aisle, I don't think anyone would scramble for it, not even college students. I might be wrong. It is only a penny. You take a penny, you polish it to a high gloss. You rub it, you make it shine. And what do you have? You have a pretty penny. It's still only worth a penny. It seems to me that often in our lives, we spend our time polishing pennies. That is, we are engaged in things that ultimately, no matter how good they might look on the surface, have very little lasting value. I'd like to challenge you this morning to stop being a penny polisher and begin thinking about how you can invest your life, the life that God has given you, the life which God has saved, how you can invest that life for the gospel and for the glory of God. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Gettysburg, southwestern Pennsylvania. Over 140 years ago, President Lincoln gave what we know as the Gettysburg Address. If you go to Gettysburg today, you'll find that around the, the site, a lot of souvenir stores where you can get your trinkets have sprung up. There's a wax museum. And you can play miniature golf. But sometimes we forget that Gettysburg is a cemetery. There are soldiers buried there. 8,000 soldiers died during that battle. Tens of thousands were wounded. And there is a sign that reminds us when we enter that site that it's a cemetery, a sign that says silent. And respect. When Abraham Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address, he was essentially trying to answer one question. How do we honor our heroes? And the truth is, no memorial that can ever be built no statue, no words that are said can ever really honor those who have sacrificed. What Abraham Lincoln was saying is that the way that we best honor our heroes is that we continue the work which they begun. And I want to tell you this morning that the best way for you, for me, to honor the heroes that we find in the Word of God and the heroes throughout the centuries who have given their lives in order to, to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ further and further, we best honor them by continuing the work which they begun. That is the work to which God has called each one of us today. Yesterday morning I began from this text. I won't, will not read the text again. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul speaks of reaching the regions beyond. And although I do think there certainly is a, ge a geographical component to that text, we're not concerned simply with 
going further and further. You can only go so far in the earth. There's different levels of society. There's different layers of society, even in our own cities, in our own country, where the gospel has to be preached and re-preached, where churches have to be planted and replanted, where that work is never done. The first of the four truths that I mentioned this morning, and I want to reiterate that and then move on to three of the other truths from this passage. The first one that was that in order for you to get ready for reaching the reach beyond, whatever that looks like, wherever that might be, the first thing that needs to be done is that you need to remember something. We saw in verses 13 and 14 how Paul mentioned that uh, these believers had the gospel brought to them. The gospel came even unto them. The gospel came, as he said, as far as unto you. Have you ever stopped to think what it took for you to come to Christ? There was somebody in your life. There was somebody that God sent across your path. It may have been Christian parents. It may have been in a Bible-believing church. But there was someone at some point in their life who was burdened for your soul, who prayed for you, and who brought the gospel to you. And the least that we can do as believers is to continue that work in the lives of others. Don't you agree? How many of you remember what I said yesterday morning? I know it was kind of a lame joke, but there was some truth to it. Uh, about my father. What my father did for over 20 years. What, what was it? He was a prison guard. I neglected to tell you that for a number of years, as my father was a prison guard, I was on the other side of the law. And in fact, lived a life as a rebel, far from God, a hater of Christians, and it was because people loved me. As unloving, as filled with hate that I was, it was because of that that I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Please understand what I'm saying this morning. I've been saved over 30 years and, and in many ways hate to go back there. Because I know that that was, a, that was another Steve Davis back then. But it's good for me to remember that the gospel came to me and, and what God did in my life. How He radically transformed my life. Now some people might say, you know Steve, you've had a dramatic conversion. Let me tell you something. Every conversion is dramatic. There may be circumstances that appear more dramatic to us than to others. I thank God my wife, whom I've been married for over 30 years now, got saved as a young girl, eight years old. What a wonderful work of grace. I was saved when I was 19 years old. I had to go through a, a number of things before I came to Christ, things that I would have rather not have gone through. So I want you to understand that when I talk about remembering what God has done, it's not glorifying the past. It's not glorifying sin. But when I realized the work of grace in my life, I came to that point very early on where I said, like the Apostle Paul, Lord, what do you want me to do? I mean, when I saw what He took me from, and that I can stand before you today is a work of the grace of God. I'll never forget the night when my dad was working at the prison in Philadelphia, a number of prisons there, and a uh, paddy wagon, as we called them back then. I don't actually know what they're called now. Police vans, maybe. Uh, a paddy wagon pulled up to the gates of this walled prison. It's like a fortress. And the guards opened the doors and began to let some of the prisoners out of the paddy wagon. 
to get registered and go into the prison. One of the prisoners said to the driver of the van, my dad works here. That was me. Right away, they made some phone calls because, obviously, I can't go to prison where my dad's a guard. And uh, they made some phone calls, turned the van around, took me to another place, uh, and held me there for a while. But that, that was my life. It wasn't that I didn't know the truth. It wasn't that I never heard the gospel. It's just I, I didn't care. I really didn't care because I wanted to live my life my way. And so for a number of years, that's how I lived. Uh, I couldn't wait until I turned 17. You know what happens when you're 17 in Pennsylvania? You can drop out of high school. So I dropped out of high school. Why go to high school? Why work? When you can do business, when you can, can sell drugs and, and, and burglary. And that, that was my life. And again, I simply say it for this reason that if it wasn't for God intervening in my life, I know where I would be today. I would still be lost. Or I'd be in hell. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I, I, I don't want to get over it. Problem is, some of you have already gotten over that. Yeah, I'm saved. And you don't realize the cost. You don't realize the price that Jesus paid because He loves you. Sometimes we just need to remember. Remember how good God really is. I don't know how many times I came this close. I came this close because of my own stupidity, because of my own rebellion, this close to death. Overdose, I was a heroin addict, getting shot at. And when I think that God preserved my life, you know what I want to say to Him? Lord, what do you want me to do? And see, that really ought to be the cry of every heart here this morning. Lord, here I am. Whatever my ambition, whatever my plans. So this morning there is something that you need to remember. Remember that the gospel came to you. Remember that someone brought the gospel to you. Secondly, and I need to move on with this, there's also something that needs to be done in your life. Look, look down in verse 15 with me. Paul said in verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. This is that something that needs to be done in your life. Paul says, when your faith is increased, then something will be able to happen when it comes to ministry. And that is, that is true in all of our lives. Paul's not talking about saving faith. He's talking about that progress that we make as believers in our lives, as, as we not only long to trust God more, but we learn to trust Him. Paul says, when your faith is increased, then we will be able to have greater ministry. Many of you are here day, to, day by day trusting God already. You may not know where the next school payment is going to come from. You may leave here with a mountain of debt. And you're already learning to trust God. And that, that will take place your entire life. I learned long ago when it comes to ministry and it comes to life, 
that you don't always get to do what you want to do in life. You're going to have your plans. Some of them will come to fruition. Many of them won't. There will be disappointments because you didn't get to do what you really wanted to do. But I, but, but I want you to think about this. And this is something that has encouraged me throughout the years. I don't always get to do what I, Steve Davis, want to do. But I do get to do what I should do. And I do get to do what God wants me to do. And so you will trust God day by day, by faith, and He will he'll give you the desires of your heart, as the Word of God tells us. But they will be those desires that are in accordance with His desires. And I can say today that looking back over, over 30 years of being saved in, in ministry, that although I always didn't get to do what I really wanted to do, I have no regrets because I really got to do what God wanted me to do. And God simply asks you to put yourself in that place to trust Him. Dr. Burgraff mentioned something about uh, short-term ministries, tent makers. I'd like to challenge you with something. I'd like to challenge each one of you, and again, they're, they're, when I look at all the opportunities here, I'm somewhat amazed as I go from table to table. I would like to challenge every one of you to consider, before God, going someplace, investing your life somewhere for some time, whatever that might be, for a year, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, whether it's in an inner city church planting ministry, but somewhere. To say, Lord, if this is what you want, I am willing to set aside my plans and my ambitions and invest my life in ministry somewhere and see where that takes me. It may just take you right back to where you are, but allow you to serve Christ in a fuller way. In a, in, a, in a more satisfying way. It may be that God will use that ministry to lead you into further ministry and either full-time ministry, but whatever, whatever it may be. If you were to say, Lord, and, and i got to have to be careful how I say this. I don't admire Mormon missionaries. But there is something I do admire about young people who have ingrained in them throughout their lives that in some point, I, I know it's somewhat uh, uh, legalistic, some rule, regulation that they have to do. I'm not talking about that. But for young people who say, I'm going to give two years of my life to go overseas and learn a language and, and, uh, and, and, and tell people about a false religion. How about our young people? I don't think you can help but notice as you look around that uh, the missionary force is aging. And uh, most of our ministry, for many of us, is behind us as far as years. And now God is calling you into the harvest. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I, I can't do that. You're right, you can't do it. But God can do it. God can do it in you. He will stretch your faith. There's something that needs to take place in your life. Thirdly, and again, I'm having to kind of highlight this a little bit uh, to get to the end of this, but thirdly, not only is there something you need to remember and something that needs to be done in your life, there's also somewhere where there are those who have yet to hear the gospel. Paul speaks here then of the regions beyond in verse 16. He's talking about those places that have not yet had access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to reach those places, we're going to have to think and pray and strategize how we're going to do this. That's why we have directors here. That's why we have people looking at different areas and they have different areas of expertise and they're simply asking the question, how can we reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
There's a price to pay for that. And I have to confess today that in many of our Bible-believing churches, our churches have not been willing to pay that price. They haven't been willing to pay the price in resources. It breaks my heart when I hear story after story of, of ministries, of mission agencies that are suffering when there's never been a day in spite of the economic meltdown that we're living in right now, there's never been a day where we've had more resources at our disposal to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. We could do it. You could do it in your generation. Our generation didn't do it. I don't know if it's that we were baby boomers. I don't know if it's that we bought into to modern consumerism. I don't know if it's that we, 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 we put our lives on, on credit cards to get what God never wanted us to have. Strapped us. Where we had that American vision of the home and the car and, and the 401k and all these things, we needed to be happy. I read recently that only 3% of money given to churches, 3% of money given to churches goes from ministry to unbelievers. Now, you think about that. 3% of the tithes and offerings in your average church, and thank God there's a lot of exceptions. I hope your church will be the exception. I hope you'll go home and you'll go to that church and you'll, you'll help to make it that exception. 3% of our tithes and offerings that go for unbelievers, to minister to unbelievers, where's the rest of it going? I'll tell you where it's going. It's going for member care. It's going for our own comfort. I'm not against comfort. I'm not against member care. But at some point, I have to ask that if before God, the way that we handle our resources, God's resources, becomes obscene. There are yet those places where no one has gone. Robert Moffat said years ago in Africa, he said, I've often seen in the morning light the smoke from a thousand villages where no missionary has ever gone. That is as true today, that is as true in our nation, where there are countless multitudes of people who have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, and I'm going to have to close with this, You find at the end of this chapter that there's someone besides you who finally decides the value of the output of your life. We have something in the ministry where I work called an employee evaluation. Sometimes we call it peer review. We call it different things. But basically what it is, it is someone who is evaluating what you've done in the past year or two years, whether it's in the workforce or whether it's in ministry, it happens where someone is evaluating you. And there's a list of things they look at, and there's, there's uh, some comments that they'll make, and there's, there's some recommendations that they'll make. And I've always thought how nice it would be if I could write my own evaluation of myself. I'm sure it would be a lot better than anyone else would evaluate me. I mean, I could say, you know, Steve Davis is the hardest working pastor on the staff. He is the most effective. He is the most likable. Uh, there are people coming to church week after week simply because he's here. He is an invaluable asset. Deserves much more money than he's making. And we recommend a hefty increase in his salary this coming year. I could write a great evaluation about myself. We all could about ourselves. Paul's saying here, as he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 9, we won't turn there, 
But he quotes from that great text where, where he talks about the wise man. He says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. But he says, let him boast in this. Let him glory in this. Let him boast that, that he knows me and that he understands me. You see, we need to keep in mind that there's someone besides us, someone besides our friends and our peers. There's someone who will really determine the value of the output, the investment of our lives. And we need to keep that in mind as, as, as we serve Christ. What, in, into what am I investing my life as a child of God? I love that song, and I'll close with it, but I won't sing it. I will not boast in anything, nor power, nor wisdom, nor riches, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. What would I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. Do you know the rest? His death has paid my ransom. We can glory in the death of Jesus Christ, in the redemption that He's provided for us, in the purpose that He's given us in life to live for His honor and glory. And I trust that God will use these words, His words, to get you ready for the regions beyond. Let's pray. Father, once again we bow before You and we marvel. We marvel at Your multifaceted grace. We marvel as we sang this morning of the deep, deep love of Jesus. Lord, there is so much that, that our minds cannot, cannot fathom. We cannot penetrate the depths of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Lord, fill our hearts today with a joy. The joy of our salvation. What You have done, what You have accomplished in our lives. And Lord, may that cause us to come before You on bended knee and with our outstretched arms simply say, Lord, here am I. Take me. Send me. We pray in the name of our matchless Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.